Coming up on Ag Week TV, key American trading partners are imposing new ag tariffs amid fears of a trade war. We'll look at the economic impact of South Dakota's dairy industry here from Dairy Fest. A Bismarck grocery store wants you to know your produce and meet your meat. Welcome to Ag Week TV. I'm Michelle Rook. A trade war may be developing with key trading partners. Canada, Mexico, and the European Union have taken retaliatory action against the U.S. in response to the lifting of exemptions on steel and aluminum tariffs last week. South Dakota Representative Christy Nome, who serves on a key House committee that oversees trade, says she's concerned about the negative impact of the tariffs on the agricultural industry. I am hopeful that the administration is going to end up with much better trade agreements than what we've seen in the past. But in the meantime, we can't overlook the effect that these tariffs are having on markets each and every day. Noam doesn't think the tariffs will derail NAFTA renegotiations, but says they are discouraging. Canada is imposing up to 25 percent tariffs on $13 billion of products starting July 1st. The EU announced $7.5 billion of duties and is filing a case in the WTO. The biggest shot came from Mexico, which levied punitive tariffs of $3 billion, including U.S. cheeses and apples. Plus, on Tuesday, Mexico put a 10 percent duty on U.S. imports of fresh pork shoulders and legs, ramping up to 20 percent by July 5th. Mexico is the top customer for U.S. pork by volume, so it's a huge hit to the industry. The other concern is the impact it may have on the NAFTA talks. Without a NAFTA, our producers would be losing uh, over $14 a head at a $1.5 billion loss. She says U.S. pork producers are heavily reliant on exports as they now make up more than 25 percent of all sales. Meanwhile, U.S. senators, including Heidi Heitkamp, introduced legislation to require congressional approval of tariffs designated for national security reasons. And in other trade news... China announced a deal to buy $70 billion of ag and energy products if the U.S. dropped proposed tariffs. Mindac Farmers Cooperative is still slicing beets, a record late processing season that could stretch into July. It's due to an equipment breakdown in March. Mindac President and CEO Kurt Wickstrom says they still have more than 200,000 tons to slice. They put a large 2017 crop into storage, and processing was going fine until the company's diffusion tower broke down, which extracts the sugar. Last November, Mendak projected a conservative payment of $32.50 per ton for the 2017 crop. On June 1st, they made a partial interim payment based on a projected $30 per ton, but Wickstrom says they're still aiming for $32.50. As we look at the campaign to date, and the improvement in extraction, uh, the improvement in uh, beet pulp pellet production, the improvements we've got in other areas of the factory. I think we've turned the corner and most of our growers realize that and are committed to the long term for the cooperative. He says the beets are still storing well thanks to a cold winter and a chiller system they rented when they knew processing was going to run long. In 2011, the American Sheep Industry Association launched its Let's Grow campaign to boost a long-term trend of declining sheep numbers in the U.S., and it seems to be working. Jonathan Knudsen visited Lillehaugen Farms near Brockett, North Dakota, where Maynard Lillehaugen and his son Luke discussed the U.S. sheep industry's rebound. The U.S. sheep industry, which had been declining for decades, is on the rebound. We're visiting with a North Dakota sheep operation that's benefiting from the trend. If we can hold it here, it it looks good. Obviously, the more demand there is, the hopefully the price it should go up. The Little Hogan Farm has had sheep on and off since 1895. In the 60s and early 70s, I ran quite a good-sized flock. And then we got rid of them for a while. And uh, later on then, when Luke got involved in 4-H and such, Luke got some sheep back on the place again. It was a good decision, partly because of growing consumer demand for lamb meat. The Little Hogans raised a breed called Katahdins. They're a hair sheep, so you don't have to shear them. They'll, they'll shed off naturally. They're, they're a little more moderate-framed sheep, a little leaner meat. Uh, so they're strictly a meat breed. 
A little more docile and, and easy carrying sheep. The Lulahogans enjoy raising sheep and say the animals have an unfair reputation. Say sheep are a lot smarter than people think they are. Kind of hard to explain, but uh, they, they, they are fun to work with. Human beings have been tending sheep for thousands of years. It's true in the 21st century too. For Egg Week, I'm Jonathan Knudsen. Jonathan will have more on the Lillehaugen operation in the next Ag Week magazine. Crop conditions are at historic highs. We'll have an update and market analysis up next on Ag Week TV. Advanced Grain Handling is your regional dealer for grain handler dryers, bins, and accessories. With Grain Handler's continuous mixed flow drying systems, you're capable of high levels of grain dryer efficiency on all types of grain, including seed grain. Advanced Grain Handling also carries West Steel's quality stainless steel products for on-farm and commercial grain storage solutions. Advanced Grain Handling has licensed and trained service techs and a licensed electrical shop. Get a hold of Chad Kylo to find the perfect solution for your farm. If you're thinking about selling a piece of land or you're looking to sell some farm equipment, or if you're thinking about a retirement or involved in an estate, give us a call. We'll sit down and tell you all about the Steffes way. We think it's a good way. That's how we approach it. If any of those are in your plans, give us a call or go to steffesgroup.com. Learn all about us. Hope to hear from you. Small or large, Superior Grain Equipment has a storage solution for you with a wide variety of bin options and accessories, along with site planning and superior customer service. Plus, from top to bottom, we offer the industry's best bins and warranties to protect your products and your grain storage investment. Get superior quality, protection, and reliability with generations of experience and dependability. Make the superior choice today with Superior Grain Equipment. Martinson Ag Risk Management offers a variety of crop marketing and crop insurance packages to our customers. With over 40 years of experience, our dedicated staff works hard to ensure you get the best advice on crop insurance, marketing, and risk management. Contact Randy or any of the staff at Martinson Ag Risk Management today at 701-205-4200 or visit us online at martinsonag.com. Crop condition ratings continue to be historically high and above last year, while winter wheat harvest is just getting started. U.S. corn is rated 78% good to excellent, down 1% from last week, but 10% above last year. Ratings dropped in North and South Dakota as well as Iowa. The first U.S. soybean condition rating came in at 75% good to excellent, which is record high for June. That trend followed in the region except for South Dakota. Nationally, spring wheat is rated 70% good to excellent, which is above last year. However, South Dakota's rating is low. And in winter wheat ratings, both national and regional numbers fell last week. Joining us this week with market analysis is Jim Emter with Van On and Company. And Jim, the markets, green markets right now, it's all about weather and trade, isn't it? It really is. When you look to the base, we've got to keep an eye on these rains. It seems like every morning and every afternoon, we're dealing with a circumstance of red, yellow, green, orange on the radar maps. And right now, that's not uh, conducive to a rally. It's really conducive to favoring the bear side of the market. We're looking at opportunities here for crop development. We've got great emergence across much of the nation, and that's pre presenting problems here for the near term. And when you look to the trade tariff talk, it creates an edge of uncertainty that we need to be attentive to as we work ahead. We really need strong exports, not so much in this market year, but in next, the 18-19 market year. Keep in mind, we run September to September for corn and soybeans. So a lot of what we're looking at is what's to come ahead. So in that context, let's talk about with weather, unless we get problems during pollination or something like that. Do you think the reversal highs that we put in a couple weeks ago, are those going to hold? For the near-term resistance, they will. I don't want to sound like an expert uh, to the degree of knowing more than what we do, but off the base here, you've got to look to that as a key resistance point. 
1052 off the soybeans and 430 off the corn are going to be stiff resistance points. Assuming we can get above those at some point, the price counts above are not much higher, 440 to 450 for the corn market in new crop. And we look to soybeans 1082. So those are really the areas that if we can get opportunities back towards those areas, producers need to be ready to sell. As for support right now, we're looking at support in corn. The next price count for July corn is 363. We think that is too much for the market to ask right now to take that lower. For soybeans, on the other hand, we're looking at a scenario where 979 and then 941 are the next two price counts. So if we break below 10, that's ultimately where we could end up in soybeans. The bullish weather story has actually come in the wheat market, produced a nice rally here on what, Black Sea region being pretty dry? Yeah, you're looking at the EU, you're looking at the Black Sea region, you're looking at Russia to some degree, that are all dealing with some nuisances in regards to drier trends right now. Does this mean that their production ultimately is going to downtick? It doesn't mean it has to downtick yet. But we're really looking at circumstances where that wheat market has already endured a problem here in the U.S. The winter wheat crop was lower than expected, and we uh, see that reflection and will see that reflection in future USDA reports. But we just don't matter enough. What this can do potentially is bring some export business back to the U.S., because we've really been lagging in our export demand here to this juncture. That combined with some of these poor yields we've seen so far in Kansas, is that enough to push us through the recent highs that we've had in the winter wheat contracts? You know, great question. I, I don't think it's enough based off the U.S. If we can get greater problems, you've got to remember, wheat's a crop that we view has nine lives. It's one of those that you can kill and it comes back and kill and comes back. We see pretty stiff resistance here up towards the highs yet, so I think we need to have some discipline, especially in the Chicago, Kansas City wheat for those winter wheat producers. You've got great carries built into these markets. So you need to be attentive to those opportunities. If spring wheat can get back up to 640 to 650, we view that's an area some marketing should take place, but then hold some discipline to see if we can't get up to that 685 level, which would be the next price count. And finally, the cattle market looks like the futures have bottom. Cash, we're not sure yet, but do you think that we're going to be able to build on this? Yeah, you know, the packer margins are extremely strong right now, and we look for that to be kind of the encouraging undertone that eventually drives this market to mid to late summer into fall. We really look for this market to have had the bottoms at this August level of $98, and we really think this market can stand up here as we work ahead, just due to the fact that the cattle on feed reports, we've had two in a row that have at least been a little bit more friendly. You know, getting slaughtered by the placements have been really a negative feature uh, here, but we look for that cattle market to have bottomed and working towards these 109 August price counts and potentially all the way up to a 118 December price count as we work ahead. Thanks so much, Jim Emter, joining us with Van On and Company. And for extended conversation, you can go to agweek.com. Dairy is big business in South Dakota. Up next on Ag Week, we'll take you to an annual celebration of the industry. And later, we'll see how a North Dakota food co-op is helping people know where their food comes from. Mayo Manufacturing, your Red River Valley source for Batco. Mayo Manufacturing, your Red River Valley Batco dealer. Get your row crops off to the right start with an early riser Case IH planter from Titan Machinery. Case IH early riser planters feature high-tech yet rugged planter row units that quickly adapt to the toughest seeding conditions, while leaving an optimal seed bed to promote early, uniform plant emergence. Only Case IH early riser planters are designed to leave a flat bottom seed furrow, ensuring consistent seed depth and even emergence. Contact your local Titan Machinery location today for more information on the next generation of planting technology from Case IH. Intelligent farming means more crop from every acre. That starts with smart machines and precision application. Introducing the new Rogator C-Series from Challenger, featuring a newer, smarter, more precise way to apply fertilizers and nutrients, more accurately and more efficiently than ever before, resulting in less overlap and less crop damage, all to make you more productive and more profitable. To find out more, contact Butler Machinery today. 
Micro Essentials is a premium phosphate product. It's a dry granular product. The main difference with a Micro Essentials type product is you have a homogenous granule for the nitrogen, the sulfur, the phosphorus, and in this case, the zinc is all in one granule. If you ever have a desire or a need to learn more about what does sulfur do within a soybean plant, what does the potassium do for the corn crop, we have microessentials.com. We also have a great resource, cropnutrition.com. The dairy industry has a $2.7 billion economic impact in the state of South Dakota, with 274 million gallons of milk produced annually and nine processing plants. The public got to see that firsthand at this year's Dairy Fest in Brookings. Through tours of the SDSU dairy processing plant and the carnival, families got to see the dollars involved in the dairy business. Each cow is approximately has an impact of about $26,000, um, and we have 120,000 cows right now in South Dakota. Here, especially on the I-29 corridor, it is huge. There are three of the major cheese plants um, within probably 50 miles of, of our, this university. Um, and then the support for that is unreal. The jobs, taxes, and business that creates for local communities was evident on a tour of Old Tree Farms near Volga. We're milking about 1,400 animals, milking, you know, we, we've got about 1,600 animals on the farm. and We try to do business as local as we can to keep everybody going in this area. 98% of them in the United States are family-owned businesses, and they spend most of their money locally. The other goal of Dairy Fest was to show the public how dairy products are produced. Speaker Sue McCloskey is doing that on her Indiana farm, one of the largest agro-tourism attractions in the U.S. Where we talk about um, how you know, safe, affordable, delicious and nutritious milk is. She also helped develop Fairlife products distributed through Coca-Cola. About 3,000 people attended the three-day Dairy Fest. More and more people want to know where their food comes from, and they want to buy local. The Bizman Food Co-op has been open for around two years. It gets products from about 20 local producers and is working to increase that number. Co-op manager Carmen Hoffner says their customers like supporting local producers and knowing how they produce their food. Since opening, we've tried to um, let people know exactly where our products are coming from and trying to clearly label everything so they know. And our suppliers and producers have been really great about labeling a lot of things for us before coming into the store, which helps dramatically. It's really nice being able to actually give people a name, say, oh, Dwight does such a great job, Jonathan and Hannah do such a great job. It's, it's a lot of fun. People really appreciate that. Hopner says the co-op is always open to offering new products and working with new producers. They sell produce, meats, baked goods, and other personal items. Some parts of the region got badly needed rain while others are still dry. What will the coming week bring? Here's your agri-weather forecast. Weather portion of Ag Week now, and we are approaching the middle part of June in this forecast period with a little arm, you might say, of hot weather sticking up through the Great Plains, but it won't last. The warm weather will be pushed back by a little meandering jet stream, and that's something that often happens in June. We get summery temperatures in June, but we get a jet stream that still thinks it's springtime this time of year, so it goes up and down, and we can get temporary cool weather intrusions. But generally speaking, the heat will stay mostly pretty far south where it's been. Texas will continue to be parched. Panhandle region will as well. But the warm weather will sag a little southward and overall the country is going to be a little bit milder top to bottom over the next week or so. The cooler weather will remain pretty far up north. Heading into the second week, which is truly the middle part of June, there will be a shift in the jet stream, which I think will pull some fairly hot weather back up into the southwest temporarily. And then our meandering jet is expected to bring a bit of cool weather into the northern plains as a low pressure trough develops. That could bring some late June rainfall as well. Stormy weather around the region, uh, moving out of the region uh, tonight, tomorrow, in through Sunday night, Monday, and then out of the uh, Northern Plains region. Elsewhere, there's going to be a lot of rain in the southeast. It's been wet there. This week will be another wet week in the southeast. A couple of weather systems will bring scattered showers and storms from time to time, and we're not skipping the Corn Belt either. There will be a few periods of showers and thunderstorms around uh, many areas 
areas of the central and western Corn Belt as well. The second week, precipitation-wise, is going to bring, I think, a pretty good chance of rain into the northern plains. As this jet stream buckles, there will be a chance, I think, for some pretty good rainfall. The heat will mostly stay a little further south. June storms, difficult to forecast because they're random and a little bit of a cooling trend. Total Ag Industries is the leader in total control. The future of ceramic nozzle technology is here today with the Total Ag Air Induction Turbo Nozzle, the only ceramic triple spray nozzle on the market. Works with all sprayers for better weed control and wheel tracks. Are you ready for a longer lasting sprayer nozzle? Call 701-636-4524 for 10% off your first order or go to TotalAg.com to learn more. Ag Week is excited to bring you the Ag Week app with useful features and the latest news and information right at your fingertips. Get your Ag Week news, weather, and the latest episodes of Ag Week TV. Plus, see real time information on the futures market and view local cash bids for your crops. Stay updated and take Ag Week with you wherever you are. Download the Ag Week app today. This is Dennis Beliski reminding you, we do auctions and we do them well. You've built your operation with hard work and when it's time to sell, all or part, you deserve the best. Details from repairs and preparation to promotion and settlements are not routine. Chances are you'll only do this once, so we'll tailor an auction just for you and get it done right. On site at your farm or added to one of our highly successful Alaris Center auctions, we have the skill, reputation, and integrity to meet your needs with best-in-class commitment and quality service. Find us at resourceauction.com or call 701-757-4015. Luckin Trucks and Parts sells quality used parts for all makes and models. With over 50 acres of trucks and parts and new inventory arriving daily. Family owned and operated since 1966, Luckin's specializes in the sale of quality used medium to heavy duty truck parts as well as pre-owned trucks, trailers, and construction equipment. If it's on a truck, we got it. Call us today and let us get you your part. Get ready for the biological revolution. Enhanced by Ag Concepts is a scientifically designed foliar fertilizer formulated to quickly deliver essential nutrients to your crops for the greatest possible yields. I had a hail incident and I only had maybe beans that were four inches tall. I put some Enhance out. That seemed to really bring my beans back. I got 40 bushel beans compared to a zero. That's the best dollar ever spent. Join the biological revolution with Enhanced by Ag Concepts. Egg Week TV Soy Insight, brought to you by the North Dakota Soybean Council. This week's Soy Insight sheds light on an invasive weed making its way north. Palmer amaranth is native to the southern U.S., but is now spreading across the country. This annual broadleaf weed has a growth rate of two to three inches per day and can reach heights of six to eight feet. It also has a long germination period and looks similar to other pigweeds, such as red root, water hemp, and smooth pigweeds. Matt Denuser has 23 years of crop consulting experience and says this weed bears attention. We're already battling a few resistant weeds up here like uh, water hemp, tall water hemp, and uh, kochia and common ragweed. But uh, this one supersedes all of them, so we do not want this weed in our fields. Denuser says if you spot a weed that fits the profile, pull it out and burn it. And as cover crops become more common, be sure to get your seed from a reputable source so it's not contaminated with weed seed. Asparagus season is frustratingly short. California, Michigan, and Washington are three main asparagus producing states. But as Jonathan Knudsen found out, a family in northwest Minnesota has staked their name to the green stocks for more than a decade. Asparagus isn't as prominent as wheat, corn, and soybeans in this part of the world. But this Red Lake Falls, Minnesota family has been raising asparagus commercially for 15 years. Started out just planting a few seeds in the garden. For Sharon Weiss, it grew into a project to help pay college costs for her four children. Pretty soon we had rows, which now have become fields for us. 13 acres of fields, which should produce more than 15,000 pounds of asparagus this season. Sharon and her husband Ron, a full-time farmer, operate Weiss Asparagus Farm along with their four growing children. They also have 15 part-time employees. A lot of hand labor. 
the harvest is easier with the help of custom designed and built harvesters that are operated by foot. That leaves hands free to cut stocks. We were up to a, a asparagus farm up in Canada and we took some pictures of it and we talked to them and came home and built it out of the pictures. We took the rear end out of a hydrostatic drive lawnmower, bought an engine for it and the rest we just had to build by scratch. The asparagus is then processed with special equipment from Holland, but it still requires extensive hands-on work. You get a good crop harvested, and when you bring it into the stores and they say how good it looks, I guess that's a you little know, satisfying. In medieval times, asparagus was eaten mainly by the aristocracy and the wealthy. Today, everyone can enjoy it. For Ag Week, I'm Jonathan Knudsen. Stocks are harvested every day from late April through late June. Weiss's asparagus is sold in area grocery stores and directly to consumers. Still ahead on Ag Week TV, a Minnesota farm has a 1 in 11 million birth. Advanced biofuel for America's diesel engines is clean burning and made from renewable sources like soybean oil. Biodiesel fuel works in any diesel engine, reducing emissions, helping us breathe cleaner air. Biodiesel adds value to North Dakota soybeans, creating jobs, improving the environment, increasing our energy independence. Biodiesel, it starts with soybeans, it's fueling America. Big Boy Toys. for the latest news in agriculture, Ag Week Magazine. Reaching over 70,000 farmers and ranchers in North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota, and Montana. Ag Week provides the most up-to-date information on the markets, the trends, and the people who make it all happen. We're your source for news, not fluff. Dependable, trusted, Ag Week. Subscribe today by calling 1-800-811-2580. Ag Week is excited to bring you the Ag Week app with useful features and the latest news and information right at your fingertips. Get your Ag Week news, weather, and the latest episodes of Ag Week TV. Plus, see real time information on the futures market and view local cash bids for your crops. Stay updated and take Ag Week with you wherever you are. Download the Ag Week app today. Every year, 40% of all food in the U.S. never gets eaten. 40%. That's almost half the food we produce. Food waste is a serious problem. It impacts all of us. And it's expensive. Your family is throwing $1,500 a year in the trash. We're working hard to put food waste on the chopping block. And you can do the same at home. Learn how to cook it, store it, and share it. Just don't waste it. Go to savethefood.com. There was a one in a million birth on a central Minnesota farm recently. Make that one in 11 million. One of Chuck and Deb Beldo's cows gave birth to quadruplet calves at their Sabika farm. A quadruplet pregnancy in a cow is said to be a one in a 700,000 occurrence. The odds of all four calves being born alive is one in 11.2 million. Deb Beldo says they were coming home from visiting a grandchild born on May 24th when they noticed one of their cows giving birth. And then as we drove down there, I saw three, and then I turned around, he was on a four-wheeler, and I was on one, turned around, and I went, <laughs> The calves are small and had to be bottle-fed. The Beldos say it's been a lot of work, but they've been hearing from people all over the world thanks to a Facebook post that went viral. They say they may end up keeping the quads as pets. Thanks for watching this week's edition of Ag Week TV. Remember, for all your ag news, go to agweek.com or download the Ag Week app. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. See you next week.